بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين <تصفيق> سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العظيم الحمد لله These are Mubarak nights and days in the noble month of Ramadan and that if a supragatory prayer has the reward of an obligatory prayer <laughs> An obligatory prayer has a reward of seven obligatory prayers. That likewise, that a class studying for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also muda'af, it's also multiplied in the noble month of Ramadan. And we began last week <coughs> talking a little bit about uh, Imam al Ghazali and the Ihya al and um, uh, the. Uh, uh, also, the introduction that he gives to the uh, to the uh, uh, 22nd book of the Ihyul Mudin about Riyadat al Nafs, about the way of disciplining the soul. And there was a question that someone asked about what was the uh, title of the evil scholars. And we'd mentioned that uh, it was a scholar who learns uh, knowledge, uh, sacred knowledge for the sake of the world. We thought of a better way to describe it in simple terms is is that a scholar who calls to Allah in the afterlife with his words, but calls to the dunya and the hellfire with his state. That would be a more comprehensive ta'rif, or description of what uh, ulama asu are, the, the evil scholars. And then for the sister who asked about who that, the story was, uh, the man that saw the dream, uh, it was a, a, a scholar by the name of Abu Hassan Ali ibn Harzihim. Ibn Harzihim, he was a Moroccan scholar. So today, insha'Allah, we're going to uh, listen to what Imam Ghazali mentions uh, related to the uh, merit of having good character. And it's customary in, in the different books that Imam Ghazali has in the Hiyal al is that he'll always start with uh, the verses of the Quran, the ayat. And then he'll go on to the hadith, and then he'll go on to the athar. Which are, uh, which are the narratives, as uh, Sidi Abdul Hakim Murad translates them. And in general, this is, gets back to a difference in the scholars of Mustalah al-Hadith, or the science of Hadith, is, is that, uh, is there a difference between what's termed a Hadith, al-Khabar, and an athar The dominant opinion is, is that all of those terms are synonyms, whether you say it's al-Hadith, al-Athar, al-Khabar, or even a sunnah or you could say, Warada fi sunnah, that has been narrated in the sunnah. Or you could say, Ja'a fi al-khabar, it's come in a khabar. Or Ja'a fi al-athar, in an athar. The dominant opinion is that it's all the same thing. But uh, there is a particular group of uh, scholars, in particular the scholars of Khurasan, that what they, when they use the word athar, that it means the, a narrative, meaning that it's mokuf and not doesn't go back directly to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because anything that is marfu' right in the scholars in the science of hadith is someone who narrates having heard something directly from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or that he's saying something that he heard from the Messenger of Allah even if he didn't mention Qadar Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi and there's certain things that even if he doesn't mention the Messenger of Allah you know that he had to hear it from the Messenger of Allah. For instance, if he mentions a sign of, it, of the end of time, or if he mentions a particular reward for a particular act, or if he mentions uh, something from the Akhirah, that a person wouldn't be able to come to that with his own intellect. He would only be able to say that if he had heard it from the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so, uh, according to these, the, the scholars of Khurasan, that some of them use that athar, meaning anything that is mokuf, meaning... 
uh, that which is related by a Sahabi, right? One of the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or an ethan in the more expansive meaning is anything other a statement other than the statement of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we're going to see. Imam Ghazali mentions a number of uh, statements of people that are from the earlier times. So it, it could either be from a Sahabi, a companion, or one of the early righteous predecessors, radiAllahu Taala Anhum Ajma'in. And so, uh, inshallah, we're just going to try a uh, way of doing this here. Uh, we'll, we're we're going to experiment in what is the best way to go through this. Uh, we're going to have someone read the section we're going to comment on from beginning to the end there. And so we can kind of get an idea of what it, and then we'll go back and comment on some portion of it. Uh, because we want to make sure that we, uh, we, we want to finish this book uh, in, in the appropriate time. So we're going to try to divide... Uh, each uh, session so that we can make sure that we finish it in the appropriate time. Can I, anyone want to read? Is there a volunteer? Does anyone have the book? Ali, you didn't bring your book? Anyone else have the, anyone have the book? Huh? I have it. I have a copy. In there? Mm, okay. You want to read, Ali? Come. Interactive, we want to get more involved. And, you Yeah, we'll, we'll just go section by section. Just get, Ali will read, inshallah, if he, if he doesn't mind. Ali, inshallah. Read from page 7 to the end of the chapter there, to 14. From page 7. Exposition of the merit which is in having good character and a condemnation of bad character. How much do you want me to read? Like the whole thing straight? or? Yeah, just read. At a good pace. Not too fast, not too slow. <coughs> Till uh, til you reach the narratives, actually. We'll just go to there. This is the way that the we, when, whenever you would study a text, likes, the likes of this in the particular place that we study in southern Yemen, this is the way that they would, they would always do it, that they would have the, what the, the teacher is going to be commenting on, that they would read it, and then they'd comment on it bit by bit. And not that that's the only way of doing it, and, 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 but it's one way of doing it. But I think also, too, it, it's better, especially with translation, if you kind of get in your mind about what is going to be talked about, and then you'll have that framework there so when you're, there's a commentary that you'll be able to retain more of, of what is being said. So for that benefit too, not just uh, the tradition. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So this is a chapter on exposition of the merit which is, having, which is in having good character and condemnation of bad character. God exalted is he said to his prophet and loved one in praise of him and in order to make manifest his blessing upon him. Assuredly, thou art of a tremendous character. And Aisha, radiallahu an, said, The character of the emissary of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was the Qur'an. A man once asked the emissary of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about good character. And he recited his statement, exalted is he, Hold to forgiveness and enjoin kindness, and turn aside from the ignorant ones. Then he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is, it is that you should seek reconciliation with those who avoid you, give to those who withhold from you, and forgive those who deal with you unjustly. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I was sent only to perfect the noble qualities of character. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the heaviest things to be placed on the, in the scales 
shall be the fear of God and good character. Next page. A man once came to the emissary of God, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, from before him, and asked, "O oh, emissary of God, what is religion?" "Good character," he replied. Then he came to him from his right hand side and he asked, "What is religion?" "Good character," he replied again. Then the man approached from his left and asked, "What is religion?" "To be told, good character." Then he came to him from behind and asked, "What is religion?" Have you not grasped it? The Prophet replied, it is that you do not become angry. It was once asked, O oh, emissary of God, what is inauspic inauspicuousness? And he replied, bad character. The man said to the emissary of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, give me some advice. Fear God, he replied, wherever you may be. Give me more, he said. Follow a sin with a good deed, he replied, and you will erase it. Give me more, the man said, and he replied, when you deal with people, do so with goodness of character. He was asked, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which was the best of deeds, and he replied, to have good character. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, never shall God make good, good the character and created form of a man and then allow, it to, allow him to be devoured by hell. So let me read that again. He, said, he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, Never shall God make good the character and created form of a man and then allow him to be devoured by hell. Said al fudail the emissary of God وسلم, was once told that a certain woman fasted all day and prayed all night but was possessed of a bad character so that she injured her neighbors with her words. There is no good in her, he said. She is of hell's people. Said Abu Darda, Abu Darda, I once heard the God's emissary وسلم, say, The very first thing to be weighed in the scales shall be good character and generosity. When, good, when God created faith, he said, it said, O oh Lord, God strengthened me, and he strength, strengthened it with good character and generosity. And when he created disbelief, it said, O oh Lord, God strengthened me, and he strengthened, strengthened it with avarice and bad character. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Verily, God has chosen this religion for Himself. Thus, nothing is appropriate for your religion except generosity and good character. Ornament, therefore, your religion with them. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Goodness of character is God's greatest creation. He was once asked, O oh, emissary of God, which believer is best in faith? And he replied, He who is best in character. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will not be able to suffice all people with your wealth. Suffice them, therefore, with a cheerful face and goodly character. He also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, bad character corrupts one's works just as vinegar corrupts honey. It is related on the authority of Jarir ibn Abdullah that he said, You are a man whose form God has made excellent. Therefore, make excellent your character also. Was that a statement of the Prophet <laughs> Said Al-Bara ibn Azib, The emissary of God وسلم, was of all men the most beautiful of face and the most noble of character. Said Abu Masood al-Badri, The emissary of God وسلم, used to say during his prayers, O oh Lord God, Thou hast made good my creation, therefore make good my character. Said Abdullah ibn Umar, the emissary of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to pray, or used to frequently pray, O oh Lord God, I ask thee for health, contentment with my lot, and good character. Okay. Bismillah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> this is a tendency that Imam Ghazali has to do, that whenever he speaks on any particular subject, <clears throat> It will feel that that subject that he's speaking about is the most important aspect of the deen. That when you read the early books of the book on knowledge, when you read the book of an aqidah, when you read the book on uh, tahara and purification, when you read the book on prayer, when you read them all, whenever he'll deal with a subject, that he'll deal with it in such a way that he'll make it seem like this is the most important thing in Islam. This is the quintessence of what needs to be studied and, and to be mastered. Likewise, when he deals with character, and so he mentions a, no, a number of statements of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that talks all about good character. And uh, it's appropriate that we're uh, re re learning this now 
uh, in the time in, in the light of what has been said recently about our noble Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, which clearly shows uh, that what people know about our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is very little. There was a survey taken, uh, and 33% uh, of Americans that took the poll were asked uh, what they respected about Islam and Muslims. 33% of them said nothing. 23% of them said, uh, I don't know. And others commented upon, but 50, so you have 55% of uh, the people who took this poll, which might be a fairly good representation or not of the greater population, that either between saying that they respected nothing about Muslims or that they didn't know what they respected about Muslims. And this isn't their fault entirely. Part of this is, is because uh, many of the, the Muslims themselves aren't embodying the character of their Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I know that happened in, in my instance when I first became Muslim. And um, uh, I was explaining to my father, you know, that we can't drink wine or take interest in these type of things. And he just kind of laughed at me. He said, oh, no, I know Muslims. He was a, sold insurance and he had some... He knew Muslims, and they're also in the insurance business. And I said, I know Muslims, and they, they take usury and interest, and they drink wine, and, and you know, you, you're just young. You don't know your religion, you know I mean? I know Muslims. I'm, I'm with them, and I see what they're doing. So unfortunately, uh, that uh, uh, the Muslims have become a fitna uh, for people in terms of the acceptance of Islam because of that. But also, there's another element to that is, is that people just, uh, when they don't know, uh, who our Prophet Sallallahu is, and they haven't taken upon themselves to learn about the character of our Messenger, that it's very easy for them to say uh, statements like that. But when you look at all these statements that he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and the way that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala describes him, then, then it truly becomes clear about the reality of the nature of our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is what he says, an exposition of the merit which is in having good character and a condemnation, madhamma, of bad character. And he begins with, God exalted is he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, said to his prophet and loved one, and his habib, in praise of him and in order to make manifest his blessing upon him. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقًا عَظِيمٌ Assuredly, thou art of a tremendous character. And if that was the only thing that needed to be, if that was all that was said, in this mentioning of the exposition of the exposition of the merit, it would be enough that we could just go on to the other aspects because this is the Lord of the worlds, subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, describing our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa in this way. Wa innaka la'ala khuluqan alim. Assuredly thou art of a tremendous character. And this is meaning that the Prophet sallallahu had reached a level of having good character that no other human being had the ability to reach this level. And within that also that he bore, not only did he have good character of himself, which is the essence of good character, that he had the ability to bear other people's bad character. And this is where we see the statement of our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the people who are in the most, have the most tribulation are the prophets. Then those that are nearest to them, and then those that are nearest to them. Right? And a man will see tribulation to the extent that his iman and his yaqeen and deen is strong. The stronger someone's religion is, yet the more tribulation God will send to that individual. And behind that tribulation is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanting him, one, not to rely upon anything worldly. But two, is so that he has increased reward in the next world. And this is why you'll find that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves someone, is that if that person that he loves, any time that they rely upon other than God, other than Allah, that he'll break that for them. And you'll find this sometimes. That you'll, you'll, you'll find that you'll, have, you'll rely upon your wealth. And Allah will take that from you. You'll rely upon people. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have you let them, will have you, will make them let you down. You'll rely upon things other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah wants you in that to only rely upon Him. He only wants his, your heart for Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when someone puts his heart in that state where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking control over his affairs, that's the essence of wilaya and al-wali. To have God be your protector. 
What is a wali? Man tawallallahu umuruhu. He's one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken over all of his affairs. And they say it's enough as a fakhr and a boasting and a uh, mention of the greatness of what it means to be a wali or a saint or a friend of God is that one of the names of God is al-wali. It's one of his names. Al-waliyu. Right? The protector. Right? The protector. Which it can also be a name of uh, someone that once they enter into the general uh, statement of faith, Allah is the wali of those people who believe. But then there's a particular wilaya and a khas wilaya that, is, that are known as the saints and these are people that is, has a state that we've been referring to. And so Imam al-Janayn said about our, uh, in commenting upon this ayah, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقًا عَظِيمٌ That he says that the reason that the Prophet Sallallahu khuluk in his character was عظيم and lofty was because he didn't have a himma siwa Allah. His only himma and his only aspiration was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had described him in this way. And this is a verse that comes in, uh, that comes in uh, Surah Al-Qalam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins this verse by saying, Noon, wal qalami wa ma yasturun. Noon, and by the pen in that which it writes. Ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnoon. You are not with the blessing of your Lord, majnoon, crazy. And this is the sunnah or the practice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that anyone that would try to defame the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his time, by calling him a sahir, by calling him a magician, or a soothsayer, or a fortune teller, or majnoon, or crazy, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would take it upon himself to defend. Right? Allah ta'ala would take it upon himself to defend the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and clarify unequivocally that our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is not that which is being described. This is why he says, مَا أَنْتَ بِنِعْمَتِكَ بِنِعْمَتِ رَبِّكَ بِمَجْنُونَ Right? He clearly clarifies that you're not majnoon, uh, Ya Rasulullah. And so this is the, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deals with his habib. But also, he goes on to say after that, وَإِنَّ لَكَ لَأَجْرًا غَيْرَ مَمْنُونَ And that you will have an, a, a reward that is never ending. Right? غَيْرَ مَمْنُونَ That it will never stop. And uh, if you look into the tafsir of uh, Imam al-Qushayri, one of the great earlier imams, that he brings out a, a deep meaning in, in relation to this. That he says about that, that because the Prophet Muhammad intention behind his ibadah was not to, his worship was not to seek reward in and of itself. That it was just to seek uh, the pleasure and noble countenance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him not only reward, Reward غير ممنون Right? That was undiminished. That it was being never ending reward. Now it doesn't mean that you're not supposed to seek reward. Rather, it's one of the techniques to spur yourself into doing good things when you read about uh, such and such a thing and the reward behind it. That's a good thing to do something for that reward. But the highest intention and highest level of sincerity is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He deserves to be worshipped and to desire only his pleasure. And then when you do that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not only give you his pleasure, right, that he'll give you the reward, he'll give you everything else that falls underneath that, that someone might seek individually in and of that. So, وَإِنَّ لَكَ لَأَجْرًا غَيْرَ مَمْنُونَ وَإِنَّ لَكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ and indeed, uh, you're upon this uh, vast character. And just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, taught our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the akhbar are the stories of the previous prophets. Uh, that likewise, that he gathered in him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, not only did he have good character, but what was dispersed in the previous prophets and messengers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathered in our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's one way of looking at it. But a, a different way of looking at it from the people of the scholars of the inward is, is that those previous prophets in reality were only nuwab and representatives and it didn't emanate to them except from him to begin with. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. So, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقًا عَظِيمٌ 
And after this praise, khalas, this is enough uh, that a fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised him. And this is why we see uh, one of the modern day poets said about this. He said, وَلَقَدْ أَرْشَرْتُ لِنَاتِ مَنْ أَوْصَافُ تُحْيِي الْكُلُوبُ تُحَيِّجُ الْأَشْيَانَ أَشْجَانَ He says in his end of this uh, number of lines of poetry that he says about the praise of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, I have indicated to you uh, the uh, and signaled toward the description of someone who's mentioning ignites the fire of yearning. He says, Wallahu qad athna ali fama yusawil qawlu minna o yukunu thanana. That God has praised him. So that what is my words or my praise of him going to equal when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised him? He says, Lakin hubbin fi sarai qad da'a li madihi safwitina safwati rabbina wa hadana. But it's love that is in the heart that has caused me and called me to praise uh, the chosen one of our Lord and the one who has hadana, the one who has called us to these noble teachings. So, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقًا عَظِيمٌ That's how he begins it. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, the character of the emissary of God, emissary, messenger, however you choose to translate it, may God bless him and grant him peace, was the Qur'an. It was the Qur'an. Meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, em embodied it within the Messenger of Allah all of the injunctions and prohibitions that he mentions in the Qur'an. Not only do we have the Qur'an, but we have a walking example of how to implement the Qur'an in the life of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So how worthy it is of Muslims to go back to this era and learn about our Messenger and see the way that he responded to all of the different situations that he uh, was put in Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we need to take by analogy of that our lives and the situations that we're in and to respond to them how our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. He once asked, once asked the emissary of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about good character and he recited his statement, exalted as he, meaning the verse in the Quran, خُذِ الْعَفْوَ وَأْمُرْ بِالْعُرْفِ وَأَعْرِدْ عَنِ الْجَاهِنِينَ Hold to forgiveness and enjoin kindness and turn aside from the ignorant ones. And then he was asked about this, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said that it is to, excuse me, is that you should seek reconciliation with those who avoid you. Give to those who withhold from you and forgive those who deal with you unjustly. And this, come, this, this statement has come in a number of different narrations as Imam Murtada al-Zabidi mentions in his commentary in the Ihri al -Madin, and in one of them he says that uh, should I not indicate to you the most noble character traits in this world and the next? And he said this meaning that in tasl man qata'ak if someone cuts you off and someone doesn't want to have anything to do with you right, join relations with that individual right, if someone doesn't want to have anything to do with you do everything you can to be friendly to that individual. And if someone prevents you in some way, someone doesn't give you things, right, that you give to those people who don't give to you. Right? And finally, and if someone oppresses you, not only to not re return that by oppressing them, but to pardon them and to forgive them. And this is the essence of good character and in another narration that when this verse was revealed that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu asked the Archangel Gabriel about what the meaning of that verse was and the Archangel Gabriel came and refer and told him uh, that same meaning it is to do just that it is to seek reconciliation with those who avoid you give to those who withhold from you and forgive those who deal with you unjustly and these books here uh, traditionally that they would only study a few pages at a time it's only by uh, because of our schedules don't permit us to study on a daily basis these type of books that w we take as we're going to be taking as much as we take but these books are about action and these books are about implementation and if you just took that one statement of our Prophet I said and tried to implement that in your lives that every time someone right was rude to you that you were polite to them back or within your own family that you have family members who don't want to have anything to do with you that you call them and are very nice to them right or someone who 
uh, cheat you out of something, and then you give them charity. These type of things are very difficult to do. These type of things are not easy to do. Or if you're uh, driving on 92 and someone cuts you off, that you pay for them, and they're behind you, and then the, so that, that, that you pay for their way across the bridge and that they don't have to pay. Tayyib. <laughs> and he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I was sent only to perfect the noble qualities of character. <laughs> that was his mission, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was to perfect noble character. That is an end for us in the sake of in, in our deen. That this is an end. That that we leave other things that we are seeking some type of increase in for the sake of this end. Uh, and this is not one of the ultimate ends, right? Just as the the problems that we see in the in the, the community of our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that there's uh, foundational problems, and then there's branches of those foundational problems, and there's branches of the branches, right? That likewise in terms of intentions, right, there's ultimate objectives, right, there's objectives, and then there's branches of the objectives, right, this is an example of uh, how that, that character is a, 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 a branch of the ultimate objectives, it's an objective in and of itself, right, but the ultimate, ultimate objective is to seek the pleasure of Allah, right, but a branch of that, but it's which still an objective in and of itself, when it's related to our khilaf or our vicegerency upon the earth is just that, is good character. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the heaviest things to be placed in the scales shall be the fear of God and good character. Allahu Akbar. The fear of God here is how taqwa Allah has been translated, and that's one of the ways of translating taqwa. It could also be translated as God consciousness and good character. A man once came to the emissary of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from before him, and asked him, O oh, oh, emissary of God, what is religion? What is deen? Good character, he replied. Then he came to him from his right side and asked, What is religion? Good character, he replied again. Then the man approached him from his left and asked, What is religion? To be told, good character. Then he came to him from behind and asked, What is religion? And the Prophet said, Ma tafqah? Have you not grasped it? Have you not understood? The Prophet replied, it is that you don't become angry. Who in that taqda? Is that you don't become angry. So he was, uh, right, the man repeated it four times. Like, it was, the point was understood, right? And so the fact that the Prophet said it in this way, when normally if someone came to you and asked you something four times, I just imagine if your child came to you and asked you something, and you told him, and you told him again, and you told him again. The fourth time, you know, what's wrong with you? And you get angry at them finally. The Prophet ﷺ was also indicating here that it's to not become angry, and he did, in and of himself, by not becoming angry by this person, continually repeating the question. It was very clear what the Prophet ﷺ was intending was that what is religion, he's equating now religion to good character. Religion is good character. SubhanAllah. So we have it now that he was only sent to perfect noble character, and now we have religion is good character. And I was once asked, it was once asked, O emissary of God, what is inauspiciousness? Shu'um. And he replied, bad character. Right? Uh, Shu'um is uh, taking a, uh, uh, a bad omen. And uh, even in, uh, that's something that the Arabs used to do, is that if they ever had a decision that they wanted to make to do something, and there was a flock of birds, that they'd run towards, that fl they'd run towards the flock of birds. And if they flew to the right, that it was a sign, it was a good omen, and they would do that particular thing. If they flew to the left, it was a sign, it was a bad omen, and they would refrain from doing that thing. But even in the, the, uh, the Arab English language, the word auspice has the same connotation of taking an omen from birds. And so he was just asked here, and the Prophet said was asked, what is inauspiciousness? What, is, what are bad omens? What are misfortune? And he replied, bad character. And the reason that he uh, did that وسلم, uh, is either it's because the relation between uh, inauspiciousness and bad character in and of itself uh, from the standpoint of negativity or evil or from the fact that that bad character 
uh, could come and stem from someone uh, taking bad omens, which is not something our Prophet used to do. Rather, he was the opposite. He, yatafa'al, he used to take good omens. So a man said to the emissary of God, وسلم, give me some good advice. And he replied, fear God wherever you may be. To fear Allah wherever you might be. And that's what they say is the first level of sincerity is istiwa as sir wal alan is that your private and public state is the same. The way you are in front of people is the way you are at home. The way you are at home in private when no one else sees you is the way you are in front of people. That's the first stage of uh, of having tahqiq or actualization of sincerity in one's religion. And so this was the advice. Fear Allah, haythu uh, ma'kunt. And they mention a, a latifa, a nice subtle story that uh, one of the previous scholars, uh, he had a group of students. And there's one student that he used to favor. And the other students just, they didn't realize, why is he favored? Why does he favor this other student so much? And so the sheikh realized that the students had something in their heart against this other student. So he wanted to test him. So he told him, he said, okay, I want everyone to get a chicken and slaughter that chicken in a place where no one sees you. And bring it to class the next day. And they all come back to the class, the school the next day, and all of them have slaughtered their chickens and um, brought it to class, like the, the teacher asked, except this one student. He was the only one who didn't slaughter his chicken. And everyone's looking like, why didn't he bring a chicken? And so then he, this teacher asked him in front of all the people, he said that, why didn't you, everyone else brought their chickens, why didn't you bring your chicken? And he said that, he said that wherever I went to slaughter my chicken, he said that I realized that there was someone that saw me, and it was Allah. Right? That they understood that in terms of people, right? And that's outwardly what it means: to slaughter your chicken in a place no one sees you, meaning no human being. But he understood ahad, the word ahad, la ahad, right? Uh, as and law being included in that, no one uh, ahad. What am Naam. Kun huwa Allahu ahad. Right, so he said that never, I was in no place, right, except that, that uh, I said, I, he said that I didn't find any place except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had uh, seen me in that place. And, you know, these were people whose hearts were enlightened. That's someone who's attained the level of muraqaba, right, which is just that. Muraqaba vigilance is realizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees you at all times. And one time, one of the uh, children of Sayyid al Fuqih Muqaddam, one of the scholars in Yemen, uh, who passed away in uh, year 653, that uh, he had his sons to go out and get some food, and, and he wanted them to bring it back. And uh, it, they were in a particular place, and one of his sons, Alwi, Alwi uh, didn't come back with any food. And he asked him, he said, that, why didn't you bring any food? He said that every time that I wanted to pick some fruit, he said, I saw the tree or the vine in of itself making tasbih, glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, oh, and I couldn't, I, I couldn't bear myself to, to pick that fruit and at the same time when I had this witnessing that I had, right, that everything in reality is glorifying the praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in commentary on the verse that mentions that in the Quran, uh, some of the scholars say that's with the lisan al-hal, that's with the tongue of the state, uh, but others say that no, that means actually everything is glorifying. And this is, this is a reality that some of the companions witnessed in the presence of the Messenger of Allah when he held those uh, pebbles in his hands, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the companions that are around them heard them make tasbih and glorify Allah wa Ta'ala. Tayyib. So he said, Fear Allah and have God consciousness wherever you may be. hasana. <coughs> Follow a sin with a good deed. Tamhuha, he replied, and you will erase it. Meaning that if someone ever falls into doing a bad action, 
is that if you want to simply erase that action, do a good deed right after that. And it'll erase it. Khalas. And what does it mean, erase? That Does it mean that uh, you just won't be taken into account for it? Or does it mean that it's actually erased from your scrolls and the writing of the angels in those scrolls? Uh, some scholars say that it means that it's actually erased from your scrolls so that you, you'll be raised on the Day of Judgment having, not having that particular action in it. Others say that it's still there, but you just won't be taken into account for it. Now, and finally, give me more, the man said. MashaAllah, he wants even more. hasan. When you deal with people, do so with goodness of character. Right? Make your basis of interactions with others good character. He was asked, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which was the best of deeds, and replied, to have good character. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, never shall God make the character, khuluq, created from khalq of a man. Yeah, that's, okay, I see, that's easy to misread that. Yeah, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, never shall God make the character and created form of a man, and then allow him to be devoured. Okay. Never shall God make good the character and create a form of man, then allow him to be devoured by hell. Meaning, if Allah Ta'ala gives someone iman, and they give someone khuluq and khalq, character, and that he gives them a good disposition, that and allow him to be devoured by hell, that this is a sign that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will protect that individual because of the relation between khalq and khuluq. This is also one of the proofs that they use, is that the uh, human being has the intrinsic ability to have good character, right? All of the possibilities of good character are embedded in the natural disposition of the human being. Just as all of the possibilities that have bad character are all right there and the ability is there. And most people, if you find the proper circumstances to have bad character that they'll manifest, right? And there is some people that will be able to uh, uh, hold back even in situations that are trying to create them and teach them to have bad character and to rise up and to refrain from that. But generally human beings are a product of their environment. They're a product of their situation. And uh, after, uh, there's a number of different things that determine uh, the human being. And the human, it's not to say that the human being doesn't have free will. The human being does have free will. Uh, but that this way that someone grows up definitely has a, determines uh, part of the way that the human being is. This is what our Prophet ﷺ said. He says, Every human being is born, is born with a natural disposition. And it's his parents that make him a Jew or a Christian or a Majus. Uh, uh, so there is a sense of that. But that's the whole test of creation is, is that human beings will have, some human beings will have certain aspects of character that are good and others that are bad. And others will have aspects of, are, that are good and others that are bad. And each individual ultimately has to find where he fits in with the sacred law and ultimately has to look into his own soul and find any bad character that he has and eliminate it and so it corresponds with the sacred law and if he does have good character to make sure that good character is done not for the sake of his own self but for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so both even if you have good character that you have to make sure that it also complies within the sacred law and that it, it is in accordance with the Shia in terms of your intention and in terms of you know why that you're doing that particular thing uh, because as we mentioned last week, is that there was, even in the pre-Islamic times, like, there's people who had aspects of good character. But was it in reality good character? If there was no intention behind it? Was it in reality good character if it was done for ulterior motives? Now, so uh, this is uh, what he says to Allah so them, and deals, deal with people uh, with good character. Okay, no. So the diff so khalq and khuluq. Uh, so it's a, a khalq is the creative, is, is creation. Khuluk is your character. So this is a, a linguistic proof uh, that there's a relation between uh, the khalq and the khuluk. The uh, way Allah Ta'ala has created us and the character uh, that one of us has. And at an even deeper level is what this hadith is mentioning. 
is that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a believer uh, an aspect of khalq and khuluq, right, it's a sign that he's uh, uh, desired a great good for that individual. And so Al Fuldail said, the emissary of God وسلم, was once told that a certain woman fasted all day and prayed all night, but was possessed of a bad character so that she injured her neighbors with her words. There is no good in her, he said. She is of hell's people. And that could have just as much been a story of a man or a woman. The point is not the man or the woman. The point is the meaning behind it is that this was a person that fasted during the day and prayed at night. Ooh. A sa'im and a qa'im. Right? And, but she had bad character. And this is one of the afat or the pitfalls of worship is that it can lead you to self-righteousness. Right? It can lead you to thinking you're better than other people. It can lead you to looking down and scorning other people. And it can lead you to, is that if you are so preoccupied with your ibadah, and a situation comes where you need to show character, right? That you are rude and do what you shouldn't do in that moment for the sake of your ibadah, which is not what you're supposed to do. Because ultimately, is ibadah an end in and of itself? In and of itself, is ibadah an end? No, ibadah is a way. Worship is a way of getting close to Allah. And so, what you're supposed to do is a Sufi ibn Waqtihi. The Sufi, or the spiritual individual, or the enlightened individual, however you choose to translate it, right, is the son of his time. Meaning, that he does in every moment of his day what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to do. And so, meaning, that even in terms of prayer, if you're praying the obligatory prayer, and your mother calls you, right, and she's downstairs, your mother says, Fulan, right, and she doesn't know you're praying. If you're in an obligatory prayer, it's a legal obligation to lighten your prayer and to pray as light as you can, and then so you can go uh, answer the call of your mother to, to help her in whatever she needs you to help her in. If you're in uh, nafila, if you're in a supererogatory prayer, uh, in the Shafi Madhab, that if your parents call you and you feel like they need you immediately, right, you break your prayer. Right, it's worship to Allah. Right, you cut your prayer and you go and, and help your parents. If you think that they need you but they're not going, they don't need you right at that moment, right, then you just finish quickly and then, and then go. But this is, this, is, this is fiqh and this is understanding. And uh, there's a story <laughs> related to that of one of the, or bad, are worshippers of Bin Yisrael that one time his mother called him while he was in ibadah and he was enjoying his ibadah and his prayer and feeling the sweetness of it and his mother called him and then it came to his heart right should I answer the call of my mother or should I continue worshiping and he continued on to continue worshiping and then his mom actually supplicated against him and that Allah Ta'ala uh, not take his life until he see the faces of fornicators. And um, I know it sounds kind of a, like a bad supplication to make against your child, but this is a serious problem because the dua of a parent towards their children is mustajab. It's accepted. And uh, it's, it's something extremely, you know, you have to be extremely careful about, you know, uh, being on the wrong side of your parents is that if they make dua against you, it's accepted. <clears throat> and she could have made a much worse dua against him. But then there's this whole story that took place with this individual. Because of the bad etiquette he had with his Lord in that moment of not answering the call of his mother and continuing in his worship, that there's this whole story that he went through to eventually he was put in this situation where the supplication of his mother was answered and he was put in a situation where we actually, uh, where we actually saw uh, what she may do offer him to see. What the point of it is, is that it's, you're supposed to uh, do in the moment what, you're supposed, what is most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another example, uh, if you have guests over, in general, that it's, it's makru, it's uh, disliked to, to talk after Isha, in worldly, vain type talk, but it's one of the times that it's permissible if you have guests to 
talk and to yani to nisuhu and to make him feel comfortable and to talk about good things with him and so that if someone is in that moment someone has a guest that comes to visit him from a long distance right and that he uh and that he uh uh, such that he ignores them and only focuses on his ibadah in that moment, that's a mistake, right? That even though ibadah is great, in that moment, there's something more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And that's to take care of your guest. And so ultimately, this is what is the sharia is teaching us, is to get out of worshipping, right, for the sake of worship, for the sake of our nafs. And this is one of the uh, aspects which it gets very fine and delicate in our this is this is the beauty one of the immense beauties of of Islam is that the nafs in the first levels the nafs in a marabisu that calls to evil that it will uh, it, it will try to prevent you from worshiping and then once you move to the next level you could either divide the different levels of the nafs to seven or three general categories of lawa of amara lawama and then mutmainna so we'll just deal with that paradigm. And that, that once it gets into the second level of being a reproachful soul, such that you start to reproach your soul and rebuke it when it doesn't want to do these things that are for its own sake and to better its own state, that uh, then it, once it reaches the higher levels of mutma'inna, where it's serene and tranquil, and it's easy to do forms of worship, then in that state where it's serene, that one of the last things you have to protect yourself is, is worshipping because of the serenity and truth to conclude you get from worship. Right? So meaning just that, that, that you have, there's times where you have to put other things before worship. And in the same sense as what Imam Malik said about seeking sacred knowledge, sacred knowledge is a wonderful thing. But look to what Allah has made incumbent upon you. Because if Allah Ta'ala has, has, has made you responsible for a family, for instance, or you're a mother, that you can't neglect your, your responsibilities that are before you and the obligations that are upon you for the sake of something else. Right? And so, that in this sense, uh, 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 na'am. And so, that this is an example of a woman here, of she had ibadah, and she prayed in the night and fasted during the day but well, she didn't have character and the Prophet ﷺ said not only was her ibadah not accepted there's no good in here subhanallah there's no good in here and she's of hell's people right it's the same thing that happened to shaitan right and it's the same it's a it's an archetype or a prototype of a type of individual and it's the same thing of someone that even if he has a beard down to here, and he wears his pants to the halfway to his calf, and he has the siwak, and he wears white clothes, and he wears a turban, and he has all of the aspects of the sunnah outwardly. And he worships and he weeps at hours and hours of the night, and he fasts during the days, and he struggles with his money, and does all these type of actions. But he doesn't have character, or he doesn't have adab with Allah and his messenger, or love in his heart for Allah and his messenger. None of that's going to benefit him. None of it's going to benefit him at all. In the same way that I think we were talking about in the last class, Shaitan, there wasn't a hand span in all of the heavens except that he worshipped. But once he didn't have that inward etiquette, matrud, he was thrown out. And so that this is very important that we focus upon these things uh, that, that, are, are, that are extreme, that, are, that can yuhbit and that completely. Uh, and nullify someone's actions even though that they did them. So, now, so Al Fudail said, now, so Abu Darda said that once I heard the God's emissary وسلم, say, the very first thing to be weighed in the scale shall be good character, husnul khuluk, and generosity, as sakha. When God created faith, it said, O Lord God, strengthen me. And he strengthened it with good character and generosity. And when he created disbelief, it said, O Lord God, strengthen me. And he strengthened it with avarice and bad character. Avarice, bukhul, and bad character, su'ul khuluk. And uh, the second part of this uh, uh, tradition, uh, that, it, that, that the 
scholars comment upon it, saying that it's la asla lahu, that they didn't, they didn't, it's unidentified, that they don't know where Imam al Zadi got that second part of the hadith. So Allahu Adam, in terms of its authenticity of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying it, uh, but there is definitely a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that, that nothing is heavier in the scales than good character. Nothing placed in the scales is heavier than good character. No. And so he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Verily God has chosen, istakhlas, this religion for himself. Thus nothing is appropriate for your religion except generosity and good character. Ornament, therefore, your religion with them. And meaning uh, that uh, this is a fundamental thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, placed in the deen, is the relation of the deen into generosity and sakha. And it's one of the uh, fundamental uh, characteristics of the people of Allah is generosity and it permeates many different other aspects of their being, uh, the fact of being generous. And Al-Hakim al tarmidhi comments upon this saying that uh, the way this is understood is, is that the deen is submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in your hearts and appropriating outwardly the wealth that you have also as a way of submission to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so he goes on to say about that is, is that, that uh, the more generous one is in terms of his character, that the more ability that he ultimately will do to have good deeds. And the more generosity he'll have in related to honoring even his own self and doing good deeds. And likewise, the opposite is true. The more avarice or the more stingy someone is, that ultimately will have the opposite effect upon him too. And so there's a relationship between uh, magnanim mag magnanimity or generosity and uh, this fundamental aspect of the deen. Now, and so that uh, he said, ornament therefore your religion with them. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, goodness of character is God's greatest creation. SubhanAllah. He was asked, O oh, oh, emissary of God, which believer is the best in faith? And he replied, he who is best in character. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will not be able to suffice all people with your wealth. Suffice them therefore with a cheerful face and a goodly character. Look at the, the way that the Prophet is opening up the doors of khair for us. Right? He's saying here, you'll never be able to suffice people, all the people with your wealth. Meaning, one, that if you're sincere, you should have an intention in your heart to help every single needy person in the entire world. Right? Muslim and non-Muslim. Muslim and non-Muslim. And to the extent that you can help people, economically, you should. So he's saying, one, teaching us that we should have that etiquette of wanting to help everyone. But also realizing that you're only going to be able to help so many people outwardly. There's only so much wealth that you have. There's only so many people that you can help. But there's a lot of people in need. But he's opening us a door, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to a different door that we can suffice and take care of the needs of the people. It's through our character. And so he said, suffice them therefore with a cheerful face and a goodly character. That there's nothing preventing you uh, from uh, when you see other people smiling, right? Sada, smiling is charity. It's charity. You get reward for it. And uh, there's a narration that states that, that when two believers meet, that there's a hundred mercies that descend from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ninety go to the person who has, who's more cheerful when he's meeting his brother or sister meeting her sister, and ten go to the person who's less cheerful. And uh, <laughs> they mentioned, I was just reading in a book, Awadif and Ma'adif, and it was talking about ithar, and preferring others over yourself. And this one man met his Muslim brother, and he was frowning. And the other person was smiling. He said, haven't you heard the statement of our Prophet I said him? That when two Muslims meet, that 90, the 90 of the mercies go to the person who's more cheerful? He said, I had so much love for you. He said, I wanted you to get the 90. So I just frowned so that you could get the 90. <laughs> now, <laughs> right, and from, and, from, and, from, and from the same way, there was one of the companions, I forget who it was. 
Abdullah ibn Umar, I forget who it was, that sending salams is sunnah. Was it Umar and Ali? Ajim. And that, it, it, that sending salams is sunnah. But returning the salams is wajib. Right? Now, so, so subhanAllah, look at that. This is, see, this is true logic. Logic, uh, when, it's, uh, when it's used within the realms of wahi, or revelation, this is when you get true uh, logic. And so look at the way that they were thinking about things. They were thinking, okay, well, if it's recommended me then, and it's a wajib to return it, I'm going to get more reward if I just let him begin giving salams, and then I can return the salams, so I get the reward for an obligation. Whereas he only got the reward for, a, uh, for something that's recommended. But despite that, the, our Prophet said him that it was from his sunnah to begin people with salams. Uh, that he used to begin, uh, and it's one of the signs of the end of time, that uh, you will, people will only send salams to the people that they know. And we were just at the message of it. It's just amazing. Like there's some people, like you, they get so uncomfortable when you send them salams. It's it's really a a negative thing. I just we just walked by someone the other day after Juma, and he was just kind of playing with his phone or whatever. He says salam alaikum. And he just no kind of response or like you know what I mean what kind of you know someone says salam alaikum to you. You're supposed to look them in the eye. Alaikum as salam. Wa rahmatullah. What's the verse? فَحَيُّ بِتَحِيَّةٍ بِتَحِيَّةٍ مِثْرِيَ بِهَا What's the verse? Right? You're supposed to respond with a greeting, the likes of it or even greater. Right? If someone says, As-salamu alaykum to you, alaykum as-salam wa rahmatullah. Someone says, alaykum as-salam wa rahmatullah. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Alaykum as-salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And you're supposed to return with the same greeting or even better than it. You know what I mean? You're supposed to give people your attention. It's bad etiquette. If someone's uh, greeting you, that you're just occupying what you're doing, you're supposed to turn towards them, face them, give them your full attention, and then get back to doing what you're doing. And these simple etiquettes, you know, that 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 many Muslims have lost, that 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 we have to bring life to the Sunnah of our Prophet Muhammad and that's one of them is spreading a salam and spreading peace. It's one of the things that Abdullah ibn Salam, uh, the famous, uh, the 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 great. Uh, uh, scholar of Islam and Sahabi that was previously a Jew when he became Muslim. One of the first things uh, that he uh, heard the Prophet Muhammad say well, when he was in Medina, when he was just talking about uh, that spreading salam, of just salam, spreading salam, and praying in the night when people are niyam, when they're sleeping, right? That you'll enter into paradise, right? That you'll enter into paradise with salam, with with peace. Alam anta salamu wa minka salamu wa ilayka yu'da salam fa hayyina rabbina bis salam wa adkhalna daraka dara salam tabarakta wa ta'alayt ya dal jalali wal ikram tayyib ayywa okay where were we Suffice them therefore with a cheerful face and goodly character. He also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, bad character corrupts one's works just as vinegar corrupts honey. Ooh. Uh, meaning, an example of that would be is that someone who uh, gives charity, right, and then follows it up with men and adha. Ya ayyuhal ladhin amunu la tubtilu sadaqatikum bil manni wal adha. O you who believe, don't nullify or Render void your charity that you give with men or uh, and what and, and by reminding people what you did for them and harming them, right? So meaning that uh, bad character, how could just as vinegar corrupts honey? Meaning a good thing is giving charity, right? But you could corrupt that charity by having men or adha. That's an example, and likewise uh, other things. It is related on the authority of Jirid and Abdullah that he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You are a man whose form God has made excellent, therefore make excellent your character also. Jirir ibn Abdullah was one of the most beautiful of the companions. And our Prophet uh, told him, your, Allah has made your form excellent, right? Therefore make excellent your character also. Al Bara ibn Azib said, The emissary of God وسلم, was of all men the most beautiful of face and the most noble of character. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
He was the most beautiful and had the most beautiful character of any human being that has ever lived. Said Abu Mas'ud al-Badri. Al-Badri here is because he was from that region of Badr, not that he fought in Badr. The emissary of God وسلم, used to say during his prayers, O oh Lord God, Thou hast made my creation. Thou hast made good my creation. Therefore make good my character. And everyone knows that's the dua. And he used to recite Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he looked into the mirror. Allahumma kama hasanta khalki fa hasan khuluqi. O oh Allah, as you've uh, made my outward, my physical disposition beautiful, make my character beautiful. And Abdullah ibn Umar said that the emissary of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to frequently pray, O oh Lord God, I ask thee for health, contentment with my lot, and good character. It is related on the authority of Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, that the Prophet Sallallahu said, the honor of a Muslim is his religion. His lineage is his good character, and his virtue is his intellect. And this is a hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu is challenging, as Sidi Abdul Hakim Rad mentions in the footnotes, uh, the tribal and egotistic values of the pre-Islamic period. A and uh, that the honor of a Muslim is his religion, the karam of the Muslim. And that in the pre-Islamic times, that there was different ways that they would determine their honor. But what our Prophet Sallallahu was saying is that the, this honor is not referred to any of these ignorant pre-Islamic things that you're referring to. The honor of an individual is related to his religion. His lineage or his hasab is not that fact of his parents and how in the, the way in who he was who gave birth to him right but it's related to his good character that's the true way that we determine the nobility of an individual through his character and there's what's called amongst the arabs hasab and nasab nasab is the lineage of where you your parents 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 and the tribe that you tend to go back to or family that you're from and hasab also can be used for lineage but Someone could have hasab, right, which is a type of social nobility or a virtue or a place among society, some type of standing in society, even if they don't have lineage. Hasab could also come from wealth, it could come from knowledge, it could come from a, a number of other things. And so here he's saying that the true hasab, and you'll find this in, when they describe in the biographical uh, 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 sketches of, you know, they'll say that this is a person of uh, strong nesib and had a lot of hasab, right? Uh, and, and so it's slightly different than nesib. But what our Prophet is saying that the true hasab, the true way that we distinguished, and the true way nobility should be distinguished is through character. And his virtue, his murua is his intellect, is his aql. Uh, murua is someone's legal respectability. This was something uh, 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 deeply embedded in the uh, pre-Islamic Arabs. But uh, muru'a uh, is related to his takhalluq bi akhlaqi amthadihi fi zaman wal makan. Is adopting the akhlaq or the attributes of character that the likes of him, of that person would in that time and place that he's from. And so that uh, uh, muru'a is... Uh, something that will prevent someone from doing something because it's socially unacceptable. And what our Prophet Sallallahu is saying is, is that the understanding of murua in the pre-Islamic times is not what the true understanding of murua should be. That true murua is related to a person's intellect. It's related to a person using his intellect to prevent him from falling into lowly things that without intellect and the overcoming of his passions that he would fall into them. So we said the honor of a Muslim is his religion, his lineage is his good character, and his virtue is his intellect. Now I'm in, in, uh, it's coming, uh, the statement, in in akramukum in Allahi atqaqum. Right, the most, uh, in akramukum, it's also from karam. Akramukum, the most noble of you in the sight of God are the most God conscious. Now, uh, Usama ibn Sharik, a companion, said, I once witnessed the Bedouins asking the Prophet ﷺ, what is the best thing a bondsman can be given? And he replied, good character. SubhanAllah, good character, good character, good character. Tradition after tradition. And he said, Sallallahu the most beloved of you to me on the day of arising 
And the ones who shall sit closest to me will be the best of you in character. La ilaha illallah. And that should be one that really moves us. If we have love in our heart for the Messenger of Allah, and we realize, if we realize, that's why they say that mahabba is based on ma'rifah. Love is based upon knowing someone. And so to the extent that we know the greatness of that statement will be to the extent that we learn, yearn for that reality to take place and be to the extent that we practically do things in our life to attain that. Right? The ones who shall sit closest to me will be the best of you in character. If we realized what that, the reality of what that statement meant, of what it would be to be close to the Prophet ﷺ, right? In the Akhirah, La ilaha illallah. Ibn Abbas said, the emissary of God ﷺ once said, there are three things which, when they are all absent from a man, should lead you to take no account of his works. Meaning, if they're not there, forget, forget all the other works that he does. A taqwa or piety which restrains him from disobedience to God. A clemency or hilm or for, uh, uh, the state of being forbearing, a state of mildness, which prevents him from harming the foolish and a noble character with which he lives among men. One of his supplications, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when the prayer was, uh, in the prayer was, when beginning the prayer was, O oh Lord God, guide me to the better traits of character, for assuredly no one guides to the better traits of character but thee, and preserve me from the bad traits of character, for assuredly no one may preserve me from them but thee. And it said, one day when we were with the messenger of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, good character melts away sin, just as the sun melts ice. Allahu Akbar. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, good character is part of man's saving felicity. Because it was by it that one attains the good of this world and the next. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, good character is auspiciousness, yuman. So we had the other shu'um and then yuman. Right? Meaning this is, it's baraka. It's good that uh, God given good. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to Abu Dhar, Abu, Abu Dhar, there is no intelligence like foresight, a tadbir. And no lineage hasab like good character. A tadbir is uh, another fi agibat al amr, is looking to the end result of a particular thing, is what tadbir is. And so to, uh, to look at the end of things is the essence of intelligence. And that's the essence of the intellect is realizing that the consequences, whether good or bad, of doing a particular act. And then refraining or doing it accordingly. It is related uh, on the authority of Anas that Umm Habiba once said to the emissary of God, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O emissary of God, what if a woman had two husbands in this world and she died and they died also and were received into heaven? Whose wife would she then, whose wife would she then be? And he replied, the wife of him whose character was best when in the world, O oh, Umm Habiba, good character brings all that is good in this world and the next. Meaning that uh, it doesn't mean that... Uh, as he clarifies in the footnotes that if a woman has two husbands, obviously that's haram in the sharia. It means that if she was married to a man, and then he would pass away, and then she'd marry uh, to another man. And so the Prophet ﷺ said the determination she'd be with whoever, right, uh, had better character. Or some scholars say that she'd actually have the choice of being with uh, whoever uh, that she'd want to, to be with. No. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is probably, the, 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 the sisters would probably prefer that one, right? I surely don't want to be with him in the Akhirah. That's a good way, that's a good criterion for marriage, right? That, that just to remind the person, once you get married, khalas. Yeah, and, and if you both die and go to paradise, you're with them forever. So make sure you choose the right one. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the rightly guided Muslim attains the degree of, uh, the, the degree of him who fasts and prays at length. Merely through the good character and noble nature. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So the opposite is true. Someone who prays and fasts but doesn't have character, we've already referred to that. But now he's saying, through your good character, you can attain that which someone attains through praying and fasting, by having good character. Allah. In another, in another version, narration, we read, the degree of him who is thirsty during the midday heat through fasting, that through character, you can attain that same stature. Abdurrahman ibn Samura said, We were once with God's emissary, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he said, Yesterday I beheld a remarkable thing. 
I saw a man from my nation crouching on his knees, being divided from God by a veil. Then his good character came and brought him into God's presence. Said Enes, the emissary of God, said, A bondsman may attain through his good character high and noble degrees in the afterlife, even though he be feeble in, wor in his worship. Yani he only have a little. He's weak in his worship. <coughs> it is related that Umar, radiallahu anhu, once asked permission to enter of the Prophet, وسلم, who had with him some women of Quraysh, who were talking to him in voices loud enough to drown out his own. When Omar asked to leave, when Omar asked leave, and he asked to enter, they rushed behind a screen. And when he entered, God's emissary, sallallahu alaihi was laughing, so that he asked, "What has made you laugh? May my father and mother be your ransom." So there was a number of ladies from the Quraysh with the Prophet, and Omar asked to come in. And uh, uh, the ladies, they were so scared of Omar that they went to hide behind a screen. And the, um, the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi started to laugh. And Omar. Uh, asked the prophet, he's the one that asked the prophet, so I said to him, that may, what made you laugh? May my father and mother be, may my father and mother be your ransom. And the prophet, so I said, replied, I was surprised at those women who were with who, who were with me, and who, when they heard your voice, rushed behind the screen. And it's also proof of how he used to teach women, so I said to him. Right? He's saying that these women were sitting with him, so I said to him, and he was either answering questions for them or teaching them. Now. Uh, no. And then Omar said, It would be more proper for them to hold you in awe, O emissary of God, Omar declared. Then he went over to them and said, Omar went over to the ladies and said, You enemies of your own selves, are you awed by me and not by God's emissary? And the woman replied, Right? So even the women were strong. To Omar they replied. They didn't just remain quiet. What did they say? Yes, you are sterner and harsher than him. <laughs> and the Prophet said, uh, then uh, said about Omar bin Khattab, but it's 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 also you know they, they mashallah ta'ala this the stories of these people are just so amazing you can imagine this you know hiding behind the screen and Omar speaking to them and they know that the Prophet is going to protect them so they spoke to Omar in this way and the words that they used are afad and aglam right it's the words that Allah uses in the Quran لو كنت فضا غليظ القلب لن فض من حولك if you are fall if you were coarse in the ghalid, ghalid al qalbi and hard hearted, yeah, that they would have dispersed from around you. And so that they said that they said said to the, the messenger they said to Omar that you're afad, right, using the elative form, the ism tafdil, right, that you're more coarse. Now the uh, uh, there's a footnote that uh, uh, Sidi Abdul Hakim Rab mentions, but also it's mentioned in, it's mentioned in the commentary of Zabidi. They says that they actually shouldn't have used the word afal. Because when you say that someone is mo you're more coarser than someone else, what you're saying is that the other person's coarse. And Hasha, the Prophet said, didn't have any coarseness to him, right? And if you say you're aglal, right, that if you're uh, you're, you're you're harsher, uh, if you're harsher, right, it's, it's indicating that the other person's harsh. But Hasha, that the Prophet said, uh, had uh, that to him, Sallallahu said him, and so uh, 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 the. Uh, uh, Prophet uh, told Umar bin Khattab, By him in whose hand lies my soul, never does Satan meet you in one valley without turning off into another. Right, so, uh, so the Prophet is the way that he balanced things out you know, amongst all the people. And one time uh, Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Fatima, uh, came into the presence of the Prophet and they asked the Prophet who was more beloved to him. And, uh, oh, you can imagine that would, you know, that's a pretty deep question. Especially if you give one answer, it's going to make the other person feel bad. But the way that the Prophet Sallallahu responded to, he said, he says that Fatima tu ahab ilayya mink. Right? Fatima is more beloved to me than you. He's speaking to Ali. And then he said, wa Ali, and he looked at Fatima and said, a'az alayya li mink. And that F Ali is more aziz to me, right, than you. So there's just a, there's just a difference between uh, hub and izza, right? Both of them, and you, there's another whole other uh, offshoot that you go into that, into the uh, the osaf of Jamal and uh, Jalal of beauty and majesty. But he gave both of them, right, their their maqam, right? She's more beloved to me, az alay. And you're more, uh, more uh, habile, and you're more, you're more precious to me than her. 
So both of them he gave them. And this was very consistent in his deal in dealings with people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the same way mm, that the man, uh, the, the, the man uh, when, who was holding the banner, uh, Sa'ad, when he was walking by on the, going into the battle of uh, the Fatah in Mecca, and he passed by Abu Sufyan, right? And he said, he said, Al-Yawm, Yawm Malhama, Al-Yawm Tudhal Al-Quraysh, Wal-Yawm Tustahal Al-Ka'bah. And he said that statement that he said, today is a day of slaughter, today that the Quraysh are going to be humiliated, today that uh, the Kaaba is going to be made, uh, is going to be made halal. And when the Prophet said him heard that, that he said, no, no, tell him, today is the day of mercy, today that the Quraysh are going to be elevated, and today that the, the Kaaba is going to be clothed. But what he did was, and he actually took the banner from that man's hand, because he didn't want to have anyone with that type of negative energy entering into Mecca. But what they say about that was, is that he gave the banner to his son, to Sa'ad's son. So meaning that he had to take the banner of him, he had to take the banner from him for a particular reason. Because it wasn't appropriate for the person to be carrying the banner to say things like that. But at the same time, he didn't want him to feel left out in and of himself, so he gave the banner to his son. And wakem, wakem, wakem. The, the, how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, used to deal uh, with, uh, with the companions and make, and that was one of his, the beautiful aspects of his character, every companion felt that he was the most beloved person to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there's another beautiful story mentioned in the biography of Sayyidah Fatima that uh, one time uh, Hussein asked our Prophet, uh, his grandson asked our Prophet for some water or something to drink. And the Prophet went, uh, he went to by himself and milked the goat that was, that was there uh, and uh, brought the milk over. And then once Hassan saw the milk, he came over. Hassan was a little older than Hussein. And he asked the Prophet <coughs> uh, for the milk. And the Prophet you know, held his arm and said, wait, a, you know, hold on a sec. And then he gave it to Hussein first. And the Sayyidah Fatima what, was watching this incident. And just look at the way Look what was look what their concern was, right? Look, their concern was to be beloved to the Messenger of Allah because they realized what that meant, right? She said, Ya Rasulullah. She says that that it's as if that you have more love in your heart for Hussein than Hassan, right? She was she wanted to know, right? Is Hassan or Hussein more beloved to you? Both are her sons, right? But the Prophet said no, except that Hussein's the one that asked me for the asked me to drink first, right? So he gave Hussein to drink first, and then he gave Hassan to drink. But the shahid is, is that the way uh, that the Prophet ﷺ used to... So in this story, right, one, he had the, the, uh, the way uh, that he dealt with the situation to begin with, right, and, and, and with his good character. But then, so that uh, when the women said what they said about Omar, saying that you're sterner and harsher than him, that the Prophet ﷺ wanted it to be known that, that the sternness and harshness of Omar Right, is not for the sake of his nafs, it's for the sake of the deen. And as a result of that is, is that shaitan will flee from the shadow of Omar. Right? And that Omar will not walk in a particular valley except that shaitan will turn off into another. So meaning he confirmed also Omar right, in who he was. Right? And having uh, that ability for the sake of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, and he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bad character is an unpardonable sin. And assuming the worst is a transgression which, which pr produces evil. And he said, so I said to him, through his bad character, a man can sink to the lowest tier of hell. Nasallallah, assalamu wa afia. And so this is an exposition, this is Imam Uzzai's exposition of the merit which is in having good character and a condemnation of bad character. And this is uh, sufficient. Uh, for us all, inshallah, to strive to have good character, even if we don't have good character, uh, that we should strive to have good character, and we should strive to uh, better our character, and especially in, in this month of Ramadan, this is a, a golden opportunity for us to rid ourselves of the bad character traits that we have, and to, uh, to adopt the praiseworthy traits that are blessed and loved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
So inshallah, Allah tabarak wa ta'ala bless us with that, bless us with good character and the reward of all these different rewards that our Prophet Sallallahu has mentioned, and bless us to be people who reach the highest levels of paradise, in the highest aspects of good character, inwardly and outwardly. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.